Great. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm always surprised um, when anyone wants to show up for this talk, uh, Anatomy of the Dead Out. So, you know, uh, thank you. Um, you know, Mike asked me to do this and he said, this is your annual Dead Out talk. And I was thinking like, oh my gosh, it's become an annual thing, which is kind of, it's uh, odd that anyone wants to show up even after I've given it one time. Um, so, so thank you very much. Uh, by the way, the Manaset thing, uh, it's, it's, I, I started with top bar hives. Um, I didn't know if I wanted to get into beekeeping really. My, my nieces and nephews bought me a beekeeping jacket actually. And so I thought it was like, okay, I better get into it. And uh, I started with top bars because it was the least expensive way to start, right? You have to buy a package and it took me about $40 to throw together a top bar hive. Uh, and I bought Wyatt Magnum's book, which was about the same price as the materials for the top bar hive. Um, and I got into it. The, the challenge, of course, everyone always tells you is that bees can't go over the top of the comb in a top bar hive and they will get stuck in the winter because they can only go around the sides. And I actually created an invention to let them go over the top of the comb. That's, that's what that is about. This talk is not about that. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the anatomy of a dead out today. And, and by the way, uh, I might actually just call on people or something like that today too, because, you know, that's a, it's a talk, but it's, you know, we're a club, right? And so as a club, uh, you know, I do expect conversations. So please feel free at any moment in time to turn on your camera, to ask a question, to challenge what I say, uh, anything like that um, is absolutely fine. I've got the chat right in front of me too. So I'm trying to arrange my monitor so I can get it all straight today. So if you've got a question, you can also type it in the chat, but just piping up and talking is probably a good way to go about it uh, today. So dead out. Um, while the term dead out is most associated with winter losses, you know, colonies can fail at, at any time of the year. So uh, this talk really was built off of our beginning beekeeper course on diseases and maladies. So if you are here with us today, and I see a couple of people who are taking the beekeeping course for the first time this year or with us, um, you kind of get this talk two times. And, you know, I, I have to say in a funny way, the diseases and maladies uh, course is, um, oddly, it is one of the fun, more fun courses. It is also, I think, the most difficult uh, course to present. Um, but anyway, you're going to get hit with it twice tonight. Um, but anyway, this is, this is a real look at, you know, how to, how to look at your colony and see what is happening or ha happened, right? If it is truly a dead out, right? Um, you know, to, to be able to look at it and say like, you know, things don't look right. What can I do right now to intervene and try and change things? Um, you know, it's tough in the wintertime when things aren't going right um, to do much, right? But at other times of the year is when you would have what I would call dead outs, or I would probably call them dwindle outs. You know, you can do something, right? And so we want to be able to do something with that. And then, of course, you need to be able to safely take what you've got left in the colony uh, and, and reuse it. You know, in wintertime is kind of nice because generally when colonies die in the wintertime, everything is frozen, any pests that are in there with it die. Um, that's not always the case in the spring or the summer. And so you need to know how to work with that comb and do something like that. Uh, anatomy of a dead out, uh, right? Uh, as I says here, a talk on simply on dead outs would focus on solely what to do with a postmortem, right? Um, as I said earlier, we're going to focus really on how to avoid it, right? And, and how to look for the signs that are going to help you avoid those dead outs. Um, and in reality, this last thing I think is very true. Most dead outs, particularly those that happen at other times aside from winter, are more like dwindle outs. Even the ones in winter are, are dwindle outs. It, it's not like everyone just keels over one day and is dead, right? It's bees dying over time until they get to a point where they can't sustain themselves any longer. You know, in the wintertime, you know, it, it can happen where you kind of do get that final crush because you might end up with just so few bees that just can't maintain heat anymore and boom, they're gone, right? But other than that, it's dwindling out. And, and in the summertime when bees dwindle out, you know, they die away from the hive. They don't want to die in the hive. And so you'll have sick bees leaving the hive. And so it, it's a dead out. It's just a dead out in, in a different way. So we get them all throughout the year, whether it's the, the winter, spring, summer, or fall, uh, we do get dead outs. And, and by the way, this is Snowmageddon. And those are my top bar hives there in the background. Uh, you can see them uh, covered in snow. Uh, those are my three first top bar hives. So that would be year number two, I guess. Uh, so we can, uh, two or three. Um, there's actually, you can see it right there. There is a Langstroth hive. That was my first Lang right there. Sort of this peak of snow over here behind this uh, little icon. So not that that has anything to do with this talk. but. <clears throat> um, so winter dead outs, as I said, are, are really unique, right? Um, you know, in, in the winter, 
we know it's a data because we see a, a pile or a cluster of, of dead bees, right? So, you know, sometimes it's a pile of bees on the bottom of the colony. Uh, sometimes it's a cluster and they're all stuck uh, in the cells, right? Um, as I said before, a colony that succumbs at a different time of year is going to look very, very different. It could be the same factors, the same things killed it, but in the summertime or the springtime, it's going to look quite, quite different. Um, winter is, is different because, you know, we can't get in there. We can't get in there to monitor what's going on. Uh, we can pop the top as I did this week weekend. I went down through every one of my colonies and I looked down in between the frames real quickly to see where my bees were. Um, I had several colonies that went into winter fairly small, right? Because I, 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 I did a bunch of splits late uh, and raised queens actually in July and tried to get them geared up ready for winter. And they just didn't store much food. So they're right up on top of the frames. They're, they're eating sugar, which is, I don't like that a lot, but I mean, you know, they'll, they'll survive. They'll be fine. Um, but you can, you know, you can get in there and look, but you can't do a lot about it. Aside from feeding at this time of year, there's not much else you can do um, except for, you know, uh, treating with uh, oxalic acid vapor. And question for the parking lot from Sharon, from Shannon, um, how often should we treat OA vapor treatments? I did mine this last year in August, and then again over the new year. New year saw that one of my four has a heavy mite load, will likely be lost before spring. Should I be treating three times annually, four times annually? So the question about treatment, um, the oxalic acid uh, only kills phoretic mites, right? So it's only killing the mites that are on the bees uh, that are exposed, right? It doesn't actually go underneath cappings in the cells. And so oxalic acid treatment is very effective now when it's very cold and there are, there's really very little brood in the colony, you know, or no brood. That's when it is the most effective. So I do oxalic acid, you know, usually I do it in December, but you know, right now is fine as well. So, you know, your treatment sounds like was the right winter treatment. Um, in spring and summer, um, I don't use oxalic acid. Uh, I, I use other treatments that can actually, you know, penetrate the, the cappings uh, and kill everything. Um, but, you know, you can do it, you know, any, any treatment is hard on the bees. Uh, I think, you know, uh, my, my guidance around treatments is always do sampling. If sampling indicates you need to treat, then choose the treatment that is most appropriate for that time of year. And if you don't need to treat, then you don't need to treat, um, you know, because you're trying to kill uh, an insect on an insect. And so it's hard on your bees. Uh, so if you can get away with it, that's great. Um, but as I said, you know, uh, this time of year, uh, you know, oxalic acid is, is, is effective, just as it says here with the, the, the bottom bullet point here, the queen isn't readily laying eggs, so there's no replacement bees. So in that way, winter dead outs are unique. When we die at other times in the year, we don't see that dramatic fall off that we see in the winter time, because in springtime, the queen is probably still producing some bees here and there, even if she's not a healthy queen, and so you see the hive dwindle. In the wintertime, she's not doing that. And so you just see the hive crash. And so that's why the winter dead outs really do look quite different. Um, a couple of moments on things that don't kill colonies. Right? I, I hear all the time people saying, you know, the yellow jackets killed my colony or the wax moths or the hive beetles, right? And, and they don't. They, they, they take advantage of weak colonies. Um, and so they will be there in abundance when your colony fails but that's not what killed your colony. Something else killed your colony. And then these, these pests uh, are just taking advantage of your colonies. Now, the one thing, the, the one pest that can kill your colony, and you will definitely know it uh, if it does, would be a bear, right? You know, a bear can come along and rip your colonies apart. And that's gonna be a pretty easy one to determine uh, what killed your colony. But that's really the only pest that's gonna, going to kill your colony. Skunks, raccoons, possums, and, and, and you know, around this area, uh, they can certainly deplete the numbers. You know, I've had, you know, real skunk problems in one of my yards. You know, they'll come up uh, at night, scratch on the front of the colony. The bees will come out to attack the skunk. The skunk will grab them and eat them. Um, there'll be a lot of skunk cud that they uh, spit out in front of my colonies. And so they can deplete the numbers, but they're not going to kill your colony. Uh, and you generally, if you're paying attention to your colonies, have time to intervene and do something about it. Um, hornets, could, you know, I, I, ha I have never heard of anyone in this area having hornets take out their entire colony, um, but, you know, it has happened. I've, you know, seen reports about other places, so I guess it could happen here. Um, by the way, that's my dog Goose in the background looking at this uh, possum uh, that I caught. I, I, used to, I used to have these humane traps in my yard until I, until I started catching skunks, and then I decided that wasn't the most fun thing to trap, so I just, uh, I've kind of given up on that. 
So things that honestly might have killed your colony, right? Uh, you can't visually diagnose it. Pesticides, right? Uh, um, you know, pesticides generally won't kill your entire colony unless somebody comes up and sprays pesticide on it. However, you know, if your bees get into pesticide and you have a weak colony, certainly that could probably take out your colony and certainly can weaken your colony. Um, so it can certainly be a contributor. And, and if you suspect that's what's happening, you know, obviously you, you can send it, uh, you know, some of those bees, you can put them in a baggie and send them off to Belts, Beltsville in Maryland uh, to, the, to the bee lab for testing. So you can check for that. Uh, nosema serrana. There are two types of nosema. There's nosema apis and there's nosema serrana. Okay, so nosema serrana is the more dangerous one. It is the harder one to diagnose too because you can't, there's no visual cue. Like no, nosema apis, you know, we would see a lot of diarrhea in the colony and around the colony. Um, nosema serrana, you don't see that. There's no external uh, cue. Uh, what we would see is that your bees uh, just aren't eating much, right? If you're feeding them and your other colonies are eating a lot, uh, in this colony you're feeding it and it's not eating anything and it's also not bringing in a lot of food, um, that could be an indication of nosema serrana. It, it inhibits the gut's ability to uptake foods. Um, <clears throat> you can test for it uh, with a microscope. I think, do I have this? Yeah, here. Um, at, at a 400 magnification, if you were looking at a microscope, if you counted about 80 of these spores uh, within uh, these lines, I forget what this is called, um, but you can actually diagnose it that way. Um, generally, I see, what I do is if I see that my bees are not, um, if I have a colony that's not eating readily, um, I, I would give them, um, you know, potentially give them Fumagellin B. Um, and also there are now supplements uh, that uh, such as Hive Alive, which actually contain, uh, it's a, it's a um, feeding supplement, but also has probiotics, uh, which promote uh, bee gut health. And it has actually been um, tested and shown to be effective in helping bees overcome uh, nosema. Um, even if you, you do treat with, uh, you know, Fumagellin um, or, you know, a, a, a feeding supplement, it doesn't actually cure the nosema. It, it can help the bees though overcome it. Right, so there's no actual cure for it. You know, fumagillin even is just a holding treatment, uh, but it, it can help them get past it and get strong again. Uh, things that uh, will kill a colony, and you cer you certainly should be able to identify them. And by the way, you know, again, raise your hand, ask questions, stop me, say I'm silly uh, at any point in time as I babble on tonight. Um, things that will kill a colony: clearly, a lack of food. Right, uh, if you go into winter and that colony is not well provisioned and you're not adding food uh, throughout the winter, um, it can die very quickly. You know, my colonies, I, as I said earlier in, uh, this evening, I have several small ones um, that I'm having to feed already. And if you start feeding, boy, you need to be checking on them all the time. Because, you know, when you get a little bit of warm weather, they can crush through that food very quickly. And, you know, they can starve very quickly as well. So, you, you know, once you start feeding, you really need to be on top of it and make sure that they're, they're always getting enough food. So that can happen, lack of food from not being well provisioned, um, lack of food because that colony was actually weak to start with, <clears throat> but then it gets robbed out, you know, just couldn't protect itself. Um, that will then kill them because they just can't recover. And anytime they're bringing any food, they just get robbed out again. Because once the robbing starts, it, it's almost impossible to start, stop. Um, also, you know, if it's, it doesn't have enough food, uh, if it's weak and then you get hive beetles in there and then they slime out whatever honey is there, then again, it now has no usable food, right? And so that could certainly kill your colony. So that the hive beetles don't directly kill it, but as a result of it being weak and then not having any food from the hive beetles, it could die. Um, lack of brood, right? Uh, we should always be looking for this, right? If you have a, a sick queen, she's not mated well, her pattern isn't good, she's old and failing, um, you know, certainly that can kill your colony. Um, you know, and if that happens, of course, that can then, you know, lack of brood can result in a lack of food. There's going to be no foragers out there to bring that food back in. Obviously, if you don't have a, a queen, you end up with laying workers. There's going to, again, be no foragers. The colony is going to die. Um, parasitic mite syndrome, right? So, you know, any time that we have mites and, you know, then that can, can then, you know, balloon to a whole host of different factors, you know, deformed wing virus, um, you know, it's just weak bees in general. You know, if you've got mites going into wintertime, even though you've got a booming hive, 
you, know, you imagine each one of those bees is coming out of its cell, but it's only at 60% strength because it's had somebody feeding on the side of it all winter, you know, in that first, you know, 20 days of its life. Um, it's not going to make it through the winter, you know, even though it looks healthy, it just doesn't have the fat reserves to be able to make it through. Um, and of course, you know, we, we look for that, then we look for deformed wings, you know, we look for shortened abdomens and, and guanine deposits uh, in, in the colony. Uh, and guanine deposits <clears throat> is actually, guanine is the feces of the mite, and so they lay it actually on the roof of each of the cells, and so if you think you've, your colony collapsed because of mites, you actually turn your frames upside down, and then you look at what were the tops of the cells, and if you see these white deposits, white spots that are kind of stuck to the cells, that is the guanine deposit. And if you've got, if you're seeing that, then it was certainly the mites that killed your colony. Oh, and then hostile environment, right? If it's too cold, uh, it, cold by itself will not kill your bees generally, unless they're just a really tiny cluster. Um, but but it's the cold combined with the moisture uh, can certainly kill your colony. And of course, uh, too little forage. Um, that can do it as well. So Robin, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of Robin, but this is comb that has been robbed out. You see the, the little raggedy edges all over the place. It kind of looks like somebody came in there and, you know, just tore all the uh, cabinet doors off, you know, and ripped everything out of the comb. So this is, this is uh, a good sign of Robin. And then you also see over here on the right, just a little bit, you're starting to see wax moth in here. Uh, because this thing was robbed out, a very weak colony, then you, generally you start to get wax moth in it uh, immediately after. You still see some pollen right in there, <clears throat> wax moth being in there because they like the pollen, uh, the protein. Uh, laying workers, uh, we should all be able to spot that. You know, here we've got a, a good example of laying workers. We've got multiple eggs uh, in each one of these cells. You know, they're trying so hard. They've even got a larva here. You can see a little larva in there. They've got a queen cup right here. They're doing their best to try to recover. Um, but they can't recover at all. You know, you've got laying workers, there's just no queen, there's no chance for this colony by itself. Uh, and there we have a picture of the guanine deposits. And so you can see this frame has been turned upside down. We've got a few dead bees in here. Um, this, this was actually a winter dead out of, uh, of, of uh, one of our club members, but you see these white deposits here on the top of the cells. And the other, it's important to turn these over for two reasons um, to check this one, because truthfully the guanine deposits are only on the roof, but oftentimes you'll have white deposits on the bottom of the cells, um, which are just wax cappings and they look kind of like guanine deposits. And so that's why it's important to turn that, that frame over to make sure that you've got this happening on the top of the cells uh, to confirm. But yeah, look at all the feces in these cells. And so that's, that's a hundred percent guarantee that that's what what's going on in this colony and, and what killed these bees. Isn't this like the world's most uplifting talk you've ever had? Shortened abdomens, right? Uh, parasitic mite syndrome, again, you know, that the bees don't fully develop, you know, so here we've got bees, they've, they've got deformed wing virus, you know, none of these guys have fully formed wings. And then you see, especially these two at the top, you know, their abdomens just didn't fully grow, right? And, and so <clears throat> what's happening, is, you know, they're infested with mites, the mites are feeding on them and the body just, you know, it, it's just not enough energy there to actually create an entire bee. And so you, we end up with these very, you know, messed up bees. And so uh, all of these uh, here are from the same dead out um, that we saw uh, a couple of years ago, actually, one of our club members. And they were kind enough, I put out a call to club members to let me know as soon as they had dead outs so we could come and investigate and take some pictures. I think we have, no, not in this next picture, we'll find out uh, later. Uh, we actually have a, a, the mite count from that uh, colony. So, you know, the, the perfect dead out, right, is um, hard to do, right? The postmortem is hard to do. And, you know, because normally, you know, we, we go into our colonies, not sort of, you know, with this um, detached uh, approach to it, right? We go in there, we're looking for our bees and we do a normal inspection. And then as we're doing it, we're sort of dis disturbing the crime scene. Right, you know, but if we know before we open the colony that they are dead, um, then we can take a very methodical approach to let's look at this first, then we'll look at that, and we'll be very dispassionate about how we how we go about it. Um, but again, you know, every time we're pulling a frame, we should be looking for indications that things aren't right. Anytime I pull a frame on my colonies, I'm always thinking, you know, I'm, I'm always hopeful that everything is good, but I'm always wary and looking for things that that may not be going right. So. What I'm going to talk about right now then is how do we do that? How do I look at my colonies 
with every inspection and always be looking for that debt out in advance um, to make sure that I'm, I don't get there, right? So let's look for the signs that may lead to a debt out ultimately, right? So first let's talk about winter, right? And, and one thing I wanna talk about here for a second is, you know, look at these two colonies. Actually, it's three colonies. This is a, this is a double deep with an empty box on top. Uh, these are double deep five frames. And so these are two nukes. So it's uh, with, with empty boxes on top. But we always say that you, you, know, you have to have, they can't be out in the open, you have to have great wind guards around them and stuff like that. These two guys are sitting out in the field and there is no wind, you know, the closest tree is this guy right here and it's got nothing on it. And then you got these two little fir trees over there. These guys were low to the ground. Um, they did have these hive stands with you know, just a little bit of ventilation on the bottom. And so there's actually no way for the wind to really whip up under them. And you see the snow is pulled away from them. It's not because I did anything, that's because the wind actually pulled all that, all that snow away from them. So if you set your colonies up properly, you can actually have them out you know, in the wind, you know, no hive wraps, you know, and these guys came out of this winter just fine, right? And so you know, if you set your colonies up well, you should be able to survive in pretty much any condition except wet conditions, you know, down by a creek or something. <clears throat> so winter dead outs, right? How to confirm if it's dead or alive, right? We're gonna, we're gonna open it, we're gonna pop the top, and look, right? The first thing I always do in the winter time is I pop the top, I take a flashlight and I look right down between the frames. I actually, before I do that, as I pop the top, I breathe down into it. If I can't see the bees, I, I, I do a nice just <sighs> breath um, and bees don't like that. And you will hear a buzz immediately from your bees um, if they're alive. So if I don't hear a buzz, then I'm, I'm looking with my flashlight to see where they are, right? Um, you can also knock on the side, you know, if you're hive like that and listen for the buzz, um, I find that if I knock first, then the, the, the loudness of my knock sometimes make it so I can't hear the buzz, which is why I kind of do the, the breathing into the entrance or, or top cover to, to hear um, if I still have bees that are living in there. If you do breathe into it, be sure to pull your face back pretty quickly because there's always that one little girl that uh, is warm and ready to fly. Um, so, you know, it's also good to wear a veil if you're going to take that trick. So, uh, what to look for with a dead out, right? I've got a dead colony, right? Okay. First off, let's figure out why it died, right? Is there a cluster? Okay. Yes, there's a cluster. Okay. Is it in contact with a food? I mean, if it's not in contact with a the food, then chances are it's starved, right? You know, it may have been in contact with a food. You may have had uh, a little warm spell and then suddenly it gets cold and it contracts because it has some brood down here and it contracts to save the brood and it loses contact with a food, right? And so that can happen. Right, but if it's in contact with the food, yet it died. Well, something else killed it. So we're going to keep investigating. Right, is there more than one cluster? Right, it's pretty rare for a colony to get broken into two separate clusters, but it does happen, and generally that happens when the queen doesn't have enough pheromones to hold everybody together. So if you find two clusters, there's a good indication that your queen was actually failing in some manner. Right, or maybe she died. Um, but if you still have just the one cluster, let's keep investigating, right? So is the cluster big or small, right? If it's small, you know, there's always a chance that it got cold and it just couldn't maintain the temperature. There was just too few bees. You know, if you get down to sort of a, a fist size, baseball size cluster, um, at that point, they may not be able to just generate enough heat to keep going. You know, did you have a big cluster though, right? And, and yet it dies and it's in contact with the food, right? Um, you know, did it get wet and chill and die, right? And, you know, if you go in there and you see that actually it's quite wet in there, you know, because oftentimes, you know, I, I've seen, you know, many colonies I go into and I pull the frames in the wintertime and it is just dripping wet, right? You know, that can be because there wasn't enough ventilation, you know, there was no way for the air to escape at the top, right? Um, I, we had one of our members one time, they had a beautiful colony. They made it all the way through to the spring um, it was it was really strong. It was I, I would have given it 100 percent. It was going to make it through, and then we hit a cold snap, and it died because what they had done was instead of having the colony tipped forward a little bit, so the entrance board is facing down a little bit. They had a solid entrance board. The colony was tipped back, and it rained, and it filled up that entrance board, and it actually filled up the bottom of the colony with water, right? And then they had the top. Uh, entrance, they, they had the uh, inner cover slid back, so there was no way for the air to escape from the top, and it just got so moist inside that the bees got cold and they died. 
right? So um, the lack of, you know, the ventilation is important to allow them to get rid of a little bit of that air um, so that they don't chill and die, right? <clears throat> if that wasn't the cause, right, uh, maybe they were weak from the virus, from the varroa, you know, maybe they had nosema, you know, or they could have had uh, tainted food, right? So there's, there's, there's a, um, when people make fondant, if you overheat the fondant, and particularly if you are using corn syrup, you can develop a chemical called uh, hydrodroxyl methyl furfil, right? And, and that is toxic to bees, right? And so if you are making fondant, you do need to be very careful that you're keeping it within the, the, you know, the, the recommended temperature range and you don't overheat it. If you start getting any caramelization, you need to toss it out because, because that can actually uh, kill your bees. This should be a course just called how to kill your bees, right? Because maybe we should just call it that tonight. Well, and again, right, guys, you can turn on your cameras, you can heckle me, you can ask questions, uh, anything you want to do as we go through this. Uh, so um, more stuff to look for, right? Are there signs of varroa, right? We talked about the guanine deposits. Did you see some bees with deformed wings there on the bottom board when you were investigating? <clears throat> Did you do an alcohol wash, right? I always recommend if you have a dead out, do an alcohol wash, you know, just as you would when you're checking from your bees in the summer so that you can tell yourself, yeah, you know, there was a lot of mites in there or, you know, there was, there was no mites in there. Ernie asked, uh, what frequency should we be inspecting our bees in the winter? You know, I go in there, you know, at this time of year, because it, it depends, you know, th through sort of December and stuff, I go in there probably every three weeks and just, you know, at least breathe on the entrance to see if they feel strong. Um, pop the top maybe very quickly on a, on a day with no wind, uh, that's a sunny day, just to, just to make sure of where they are and where they are in relation to the food, right? If they're right up near top of the frames, I know I'm going to have to feed soon because, you know, it can, you know, very quickly they can, you know, burn through that food, right? So I just want to know where they're at. Now that I've got colonies that, you know, that, that are already on the sugar, I'm checking them probably every week if I can, you know, or if I can't check them every week, I'm going to load them up with tons of sugar so I can spend a couple of weeks without them. Um, you know, and, but, but again, you know, inspections are not detailed inspections. It's just, do I have bees? Are they alive? Do they need something? Boom. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's 10 seconds, you know, it's 10 seconds, 20 seconds is all you need to do. And that doesn't hurt them. Um, so there we go again, uh, the guanine deposits, we see them on the cells and we see a great picture of these shortened abdomens on these bees with the deformed wings. It's just painful to look at that. And uh, the mite wash. So this was the postmortem mite wash. That was your normal 300 bees. And that is 50 mites in that sample. So, you know, that would kill a colony at any time of year with that many mites. <clears throat> so uh, more stuff to look for. <clears throat> is there signs of Nosema apis, right? Are, are you seeing, you know, feces inside and outside the hive? Um, if you do, that's probably a contributor you know, or cause, right? Now, remember, you can see feces on the outside of a colony and it's not uncommon, particularly in the springtime um, when there's a lot of rain. Uh, what happens is the bees in a colony uh, with a lot of moisture, you know, the bees can't get out to, you know, go for a cleansing flight. Um, and when the moisture builds up in their body too much, um, it actually uh, then just causes diarrhea as sort of a natural thing. And so, you know, if they can make it outside, you know, you might, you might see them with feces on the front of the hive because they just got to get out the front door and they're going to go to the bathroom. Um, but it's when you start seeing it inside that you have to worry about it. And that's probably something that would kill your colony. Um, did it have Nosema serrana? As I talked about earlier, it can't be diagnosed with a naked eye, but you can check it with a microscope. But the indicators would be that, you know, in the fall, that it wasn't taking food properly. You know, your other colonies were taking food. This one, just for whatever reason, wasn't taking food. That would be an indication that it's going into winter and it's probably not that healthy. Um, <clears throat> then are there uh, any other obvious signs of disease that they may have gone into winter with, uh, such as, you know, dead or darkened larvae in the cells, et cetera, which would be a good uh, indication of European fowl brood, right? So you see these contorted larvae, they're turning darker colors, brown, and then sort of black with a spotty brood pattern, that could be European fowl brood. Although that is more generally a early springtime condition. And also fowl brood is something that a colony can grow out of. You know, if you change the conditions, you know, you make sure that there's not moisture in there, maybe reclean it, they can work themselves right out of that. 
So spring, summer, and fall dead outs. This has got to be the most fun talk you guys have ever attended, I have to say. So in the winter, as we said, the queen isn't laying, the bees aren't flying, but you know, generally at all other times of the year, right, the population is being replenished because the queen is laying, right? And the sick bees die away from the colony. You know, the bees, if they are sick, you know, the, 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 they are a social insect and they know that dying inside the colony is not good for the colony. So they're going to fly off and die someplace else. And so as they're dying, you're not going to notice it. They're going to be dying somewhere else. And all you're going to notice is maybe the population starts to dwindle. So that's why I call it a dwindle out as opposed to a dead out. <clears throat> um, in the spring, right, uh, many of the indicators are very much the same as they were in winter, right? But they happen kind of a different order, right? Starvation is the number one killer of colonies in the springtime. You know, the colony you know, starts to build up very quickly. You know, the, the queen right now, at this time of year, she's laying eggs, maybe only in small patches. But if we get four or five days of nice weather, she's going to really start laying eggs. Um, and, and as they're feeding those larvae, then they really start burning through food, right? And so if we get a cold snap, um, you know, they can, you know, uh, so, so, so they're going to burn through food. And so, you know, but there's really nothing blooming there, right? We got a little bit of winter aconite. The maple trees aren't blooming yet and stuff like that. And so they can run out of food pretty darn quickly. Um, Cold and wet, right? A uh, strong colony is gonna get off, give off a lot of moisture from its respiration. And as I said, not enough ventilation can then kill that colony. You know, so, you know, I'm not a big advocate of doing hive wraps around colonies uh, in, unless you've really done it well and you've left a lot of ventilation at the top, but you don't wanna do it in a way that traps in moisture. Uh, in the springtime, um, oftentimes, you know, uh, Colonies will swarm and split, and then they will just fail to requeen. Um, that's very normal, um, particularly because in the springtime we have weather fluctuations. And so the queen may go out for a flight and it may rain or something, she may not make it back. Not requeening is a normal um, occurrence, unfortunate, but that, that kills a lot of colonies in the springtime. Um, European fowl brood we talked about, and then those SEMA, right? The, the apis. Uh, which is the diarrhea or the serrata, which is the one you can't really see, which is where they can't really absorb the nutrients. And then of course, uh, varroa mites and parasitic mite syndrome. Right, so here, here's, here's a good picture. This is starvation during a cold snap. And so, you know, how do we know that this is a cold snap? Who can tell me? Come on, somebody say something to me today so I know that you actually got people here. How do we know this is a cold snap? Frozen water. Hmm? Frozen water. No, from this picture though, what do, we, what do you see in this picture that says this came from a cold snap? Their butts are sticking out of the cells. Right, their butts are sticking out of the cells. So they're, they're in there, they're, they're trying to warm the hive. And then also there's all this capped larva, right? This, this colony was, these are all babies, right? There's all these babies under here, right? And so they were, they were, you know, um, raising babies and everything. And then suddenly it just, you know, it got very cold and they couldn't maintain the temperature. Um, and, and they might've run out of food too, but it happened during a cold snap because they wouldn't be raising this many bees, you know, uh, in cold weather. So they were raising them in warm time and then it suddenly got cold and, and then this happened. Um, looked at this picture earlier, right? The laying workers, you know, all the multiple eggs per cell in here. It's a lovely picture. Too bad it's a picture yes. of dying. Uh, Shannon asks, bees are inward trying to heat the hive. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, what we're seeing here, hang on. Here we go. So yes, when, when uh, in the winter, in the cluster, um, what the bees do is they fill up the comb and all the bees go into the comb and then everyone packs as tightly as they can between the combs and they all vibrate to, uh, so they're trying to take up as little space as possible to retain as much heat. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is what you would see in the winter time, the comb with, with the bees, the comb just packed with bees. Um, when they're not raising uh, brood like this, it would just be just comb full of bees. This is you know, comb with bees and, and brood together. Uh, <clears throat> summer and fall dead outs, right? The same things. The most common things that kill our colonies at that time are varroa, 
of the failure to requeen and then Nosema serrana. This is hive beetles, right? So what, what we see here is actually, this is, this is one of mine. I'm not proud of it, right? This is one of mine. This was a queen cell holder. So there was a queen cell in here. So this was a nuke that I was trying to requeen. But I can see as soon as I pop this top that, you know, this thing has been slimed out. So we, we see it's this shiny kind of wet looking tacky this here. And this is from the, the hive beetles. And if we go further in here, you can see this is what happens when they slime out a hive. And so all this honey then is now fermenting and it's all ruined. And we can see all of the hive beetle larva in here, which, uh, so this is not what killed the hive. What killed the hive was they didn't requeen. And then they just ran out of bees and then they're overtaken by the hive beetle and the hive beetle larva. So dwindle outs, right? Just slowly over time, we're dying off, right? It happens because of varroa. Right, they, it's just killing bees slowly. Nosema serrana, they, they just, you know, they're, they're not able to maintain the nutrients. Also with Nosema serrana and Nosema apis, as they're feeding the larva, they're actually feeding it the disease, right? And so it perpetuates and it kills more bees. Um, a queen that is not well mated, right? That, you know, she'll be working away. She'll be doing her best to try to raise brood, but, you know, they just can't kind of get it, you know, running well. And so again, the the colony will just kind of dwindle out. It won't, won't be fast. They just slowly, they kind of die off. Um, and then insufficient food, right? That can come from having too much rain. That can come from having too few foragers, right? And so, you know, they're, you know, just not enough bees to get out there and forage and bring in new food, right? Insufficient food can come from, you know, having too few nurse bees to, to be able to feed the bees that are there, right? Um, and then of course, from robbing. What do you do with that frame after the hive beetles take over? I throw it in the dumpster. Um, it's, you know, you can take that frame uh, and pop out uh, the foundation and wash it off. And it's actually perfectly fine. There's no disease associated with it. I just find it's just so nasty um, that I don't want to deal with it. But, but you, can, you can recover it. Um, yeah, so last picture of the hive beetles, how do you clean that frame? Um, just some water with a little bit of bleach, uh, you know, but you have to throw out the wax. Um, if you're using plastic foundation, you can clean that foundation probably with a power washer or something, but for whatever it is, 70 cents, I just, you know, personally, it's just so nasty to work with. Um, <clears throat> hive beetles weakened and subsequently lost four of my hives this year, thinking about relocating my apiary. Um, so the only thing I would say about that is, I, I, I don't know, I mean, if, if the... The one recommendation for high beetles is that your, your colonies be in full sun. That does help keep the high beetles at bay a little bit. Uh, also, if you are next to um, somebody like growing gourds, you know, pumpkins or, you know, cantaloupe or something like that, um, gourds tend to, uh, as they're rotting on the ground, get a lot of high beetles, right? And so if you're around a field of that, that could be a problem as well. Um, Hive beetles don't have a zip code. That is true. Um, thoughts about the life cycle and the soils. Uh, hive beetles can, uh, they, they, so yes, they do, you know, once the larvae come out, they do reproduce in the soil. So you can put, um, you know, your, your colonies on like, um, you can put um, <clears throat> uh, like gravel underneath your colonies uh, and, you know, maybe a, uh, a barrier under the gravel so that the uh, hive beetles can't get to the soil. Um, and that can actually help reduce the high beetles as well. Yeah, good questions. So what to do with the equipment, right? As, as, as we're talking about this equipment here, right? To the extent we can, we do want to, um, you know, distribute and reuse our resources, right? Um, if you've had Varroa, right, there's nothing wrong with your, your frames, right? You have the guanine deposits, um, but they're fine. There's, there's, not, there's no disease in those guanine deposits. Uh, so you can go ahead and reuse that in the, the colony. Um, if you had wax moth, right, and wax moth, what they do is they chew through the wax, they're eating the proteins, either in the cocoons that are left behind by the bees or in the pollen. Um, you know, if you've got a little bit of wax moth, you know, throw it in the freezer, freeze the, freeze the frames and reuse them. You know, if you have a whole lot of wax moth, I mean, the, 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 the comb just falls apart anyway. So just scrape off the frames, install new foundation and start over. Um, and uh, high beetles, right? Uh, cut out the slime comb, wash the frames, and you can start over. 
Um, you know, if you have the bottom board and the box also have slime running onto them, you know, just clean and wash that stuff up um, and, it's, and it's good. Uh, how much ventilation is the right amount, uh, top and bottom? I, I, that depends on the time of year. Uh, as with everything in life, um, everything in moderation. You know, too much ventilation up top uh, can actually kill your bees just as easily as too little ventilation. Um, you know, particularly if, uh, you know, in the summertime, having a little ventilation up top is a good thing. Um, but if it's dry weather, particularly if say we were Arizona, um, you know, that ventilation can actually kill your bees because they actually need to have a fairly humid environment, right? And so, um, you know, too little ventilation in the winter where you have uh, the moisture building up and dripping back on them, you know, it's just as if you're camping in cold weather, you know, you on, on the inside of your tent, it gets wet and rains down on you. Um, you know, that that rain down on top of the bees can kill them. So it's it's uh, in moderation. You know, you know, me personally on my colonies, I have um, the, the um, drop board put in about 90% of the way. So there actually is a little bit of ventilation at the bottom. Um, and then I have the top entrance open uh, just so there's a little bit of air coming in there. But I don't do anything special other than that for mine. <clears throat> But of course we could ask Joan and everybody else and we get a bunch of different answers. So, you know, everything in moderation. Uh, wax moth, that is a lovely picture of a wax moth for us. Um, and so this obviously wax moth, this isn't a top bar hive, but yeah, that is not comb that's reusable by anybody. It just, it just falls apart. And this is a, you know, I don't know how long this had been in there before anyone discovered it, but probably weeks, uh, but that, that colony had probably died several weeks before. So what to do with the equipment continued, right? Nosema apis, right? And so this is the one, Nosema, where we have the diarrhea, right? And so if we have the diarrhea and it's inside our colonies, you do not want to freeze those frames. You know, freezing actually those, those frames actually makes Nosema apis more virulent, right? So if you've got that, you actually want to take those frames and expose that equipment to sunshine. Uh, the sunshine actually kills Nosema apis. <clears throat> You can also uh, fumigate uh, with acetic acid. Nosema serrana, you wanna do the opposite. You know, so Nosema serrana is where the bees can't take in the nutrients in their gut. Um, if you confirm that, again, you'd have to confirm it you know, using a microscope. Uh, you can freeze them uh, or fumigate them with acetic acid. You know, that, and, and so Nosema serrana uh, is actually less virulent with cold temperatures. So that's why we actually don't see it very much in the wintertime. And that's why it's a spring and summer time uh, malady that we see with the bees. All right, and then storing our stuff, right? We wanna you know, store it in a cool, dry place, um, allow the uh, light and air get to your equipment so it doesn't get you know, um, any mold, um, and then take some measures to prevent wax moth, either you know, um, you know, freeze it and you know, store it in plastic bags or uh, use some uh, moth crystals. You don't want to use moth balls. Moth balls are toxic to the bees, but uh, moth crystals are okay to use to uh, keep the uh, wax moth away. Wax moth will make the biggest mess known to mankind. It is kind of obnoxious. And with that, happy beekeeping, right? I don't have any more fun death facts to impart tonight. And so that is what I wanted to share with you today. Bob, is fumigillin available again? Wasn't wasn't it out of production for a while? It was out of production. There, there was a there was a new um, the original one. What, what was it? It was fumigillin A or was it fumigillin B? But there is there is a B. Okay, it was B. But there there is actually a new type of fumigillin that is available on the market. Yeah. Okay. You know, again though, it's it's not a cure, right? It's it's just a sort of a holding pattern. Um, so, uh, but but it, it certainly can help. Eight twenty-three. One hour. I want to talk about death for an hour. That's good. I think. I think that's a good thing. So, Bob, this is Ernie, and yeah. thank you very much. This is, uh, you know, I'm I am probably um, your 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 prime example of uh, the seventh year, first year beekeeper. Um, <laughs> you know, every year I feel like I'm starting over, and so so this is a, a great reminder to me. And this is the time when when you know, we need to start, I need to start uh, really looking at the few hives I have left over because I've neglected them in, in the, the, the normal cycle. 
and uh, prepping for for uh, an optimistic spring. Um, you know, last year I had a real big problem with with high beetles, and uh, it may be where they are because they're in a glade. They got they have a lot of sun, but they're they're in a glade. So I struggle with the the high beetle phenomenon. Mm. So they went in. They my my remaining hives went in rather weak, um, and they were alive three weeks ago. Um, haven't checked them now. I'm going to probably jump in there this weekend, but uh, they're, I know they're not strong. Okay. I, just, I know they're not strong. So what would I do now? I've got, I know I've got weak hives right now. We're in early February. It's, it's uh, not a lot of options, but, and their, the weakness is predominantly due to high beetle because they're still in there. So what, what would you recommend? That's, that's a tough one. I don't know. I, I wish I asked other club members as well. I mean, I've, I've, I always have hives that are carrying hive beetles into winter, right? So I, I, you know, I've got a lot of colonies and a lot of them have hive beetles in there. And I've always wondered why the hive beetles don't seem to cause problems in the winter time. You know, I, 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 you know whether they, I, they must be like the bees where they, they need warm enough weather to be able to, you know, lay their eggs and have their larva hatch successfully and everything like that is, is the only theory that I have. Um, you know, I, I think on a warm day, uh, since they're not reproducing, I would try to pull out those frames that, you know, because again, the high beetles, you're always going to find them on the periphery of the cluster. They're not going to be in with the bees, right? They're going to be on that mm -hmm. frame that's next. They're generally going to be in those frames that, that you know, have open comb. Um, you know, they're not going to be in the honey. I, I usually, you know, I, I take those frames and I just, I just knock them on a board real fast and try and smash as many as I can. I, I don't know a better way to do it than that. I guess uh, there are some of those, some people put the, uh, what is the, the cleaning cloth? Swiffers. Hmm? Swiffer cloth. Swiffer cloths up on top of the frames and the high beetles, because they are uh, spiky, get caught on them. You know? So I guess that would be a, a way too. I don't know. So those those Swiffer cloths, that's great. Because you know, I've been using oil traps for you know last couple of years on, on uh, high beetles. Um, Swiffer, Swiffer is the, the is the biggest killer that I, I've found yet. It's not the Freeman traps. It's not the oil traps. Um, I've used the uh, the bottom boards with uh, diatomaceous earth as well as oil, but Swiffers are the things that will get them. But your colonies are not um, they're not being killed by hive beetles. Hive beetles aren't helping them, but it's just that they're weak enough to allow the hive beetles in there, and the hive beetles are imitating bees to get the bees to feed them is how it actually works. But the bees aren't stupid enough to get caught in the Swiffers. So, I mean, I, even over the winter, I'm actually pulling a Swiffer out um, that's just loaded with um, hive beetles that they're trying to winter over. So just like Varroa, the best thing you can try and do is kill as many as you can, when you can, how you can. Yeah. One, one thing I've noticed, one thing I've been doing that, that I think it's helping keep my hive beetles down, I don't know. But I've been running my colonies all summer long on pretty darn small entrances. Yeah. You know, I have some full full size colonies that I run on the smallest entrance. You know, so they've only got an entrance that big, right? And then the other ones, you know, I have the, the larger entrance on, but never any more than that, right? And I think that also, you know, uh, I, I maybe you're doing the same thing, Ernie. I don't know, but you know, I I, I find that the colonies that I run on small entrances seem to do better. You know, and, and I never leave the, the whole thing out, uh, you know, uh, the whole bar out to leave the entire thing open. That doesn't seem to lead to good colonies for me. So the, the beauty of it, it and, and thank you for the Swiffer stuff, because I'm going I'm to give that a shot. I am a, a bona fide and, and certified Virginia gentleman farmer, which is, is if you don't know, it is uh, it has the passion to farm, but not the good luck to, to make a living <laughs> at it. Um, so that's that's me. So I, me and my 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 honeybee uh, uh, affair is uh, is always losing proposition. But um, uh, this is incredibly useful to me, and I I can't thank you enough. Uh, and, yeah. and let me let me let me go forward with that Swiffer again. Don't get the Swiffer that has any of the scents or or attachments in it. And in fact, go ahead and get if you're going to Giant or somebody the generic plain Swiffer cloth because you don't need to put anything more into your hive than, than yeah. we're putting in there already. So just get the unscented, regular, generic Swiffer cloth, unfold it, put it smack dab over the, the middle of the, uh, the, the top of your hive and 
let it go to work, just leave it there and you'll be amazed. And don't be surprised if um, you have one hive that loves them and one hive that can't stand having a Swiffer in there because I have one that every single time I put it in, within a day, it's dragged all the way down to the bottom and they're trying to push it out the entrance, so. Oh. Oh, it's shredded and they'll spit it up. And, and if they don't like it, that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, JP asks how the pests can of the hives. I've got uh, any proof hive stands. I think maybe ant proof hive stands. Uh, do they help? Uh, certainly they help against ants. If that's what you're talking about. Uh, hive beetles just fly in. You know, they just they just fly up to the hive. Same with Mac wax moths. They, they fly into the, the hive is, is how they get in. Um, yeah, I used to have I used to have a horrible ant problem here. Um, and my house here, I don't keep bees here at my house any longer. Um, and what I ended up doing on my hive stands there on, on posts was I, I put um, grease around the post and I put uh, um, cinnamon and cayenne pepper in the grease. And that stopped the ants uh, for a period. Oh, cayenne pepper, I hadn't heard that before. Cinnamon, cinnamon I've heard, but yeah. they don't like that spicy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, thankfully I don't have. I haven't had that problem for quite some time. Did anybody notice uh, hive beetles being worse last year? I think Matt was posting to some forum yeah. where he thought they yep. were the worst yep. he's seen in fifteen years or something. Yeah, they were awful. Yeah, yeah. La last year has caused me to look at. I mean, I was. I'm. I'm going to probably. I, I'm not going to, well, the plan was not to move my hives. I may rethink it now and go more direct sunlight, but I was actually going to excavate them out and uh, underneath where I, I've got a row of, of six, seven hives um, on, um, on boards and, and excavate that out and put down rock to just try to minimize the, or break the life cycle of them. Uh, well, and that's, that's another, in theory, you're right that the, the actual larva drop down into the earth and they breed and they come back up. So you would think that if you put your hives on um, some solid ground, some sidewalk, a concrete slab, I think it was uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp actually had beehives that they brought into the lab in the University of Maryland. And they found that the larva actually hit the tile floor and started working their way toward the door going along. So you know, the point is to, to try and move your hives away from the issue or even to treat if you get, uh, what is it, uh, uh, star guardian, guardian star to, to soak the ground. Um, yeah. The fact is they're, they're, they're there. You're gonna have them, they, they're airborne, they're gonna fly in. So uh, get, getting your hives in sunlight, yeah, it's a great idea. Uh, it's probably the best thing to try and, and fight them. Otherwise, the way you fight them is to have a strong hive, have a strong colony. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going nukes this year. So you guys, you guys uh, uh, update your nuke information because I'm buying nukes, baby. I'm going for strong hives from the get-go. Here we go. <laughs> Bring on the nukes. <laughs> Bring on the nukes. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to a, a really nice season. Uh, I was excited yesterday. Went out there. I saw winter aconite little flowers out near my colonies. It's very exciting. The first flower I've seen. So I'm hoping, hoping to get a few warm days. You know, because all my colonies are good. My my top bars, I've not been able to to inspect them at all. You know, because because the comb is so brittle in the winter time. At least you know, the, you know. I mean, I haven't pulled frames on anything, of course. But you know, like the, the comb is so brittle on the top bar, you just can't open it, and so. They're surviving, but I'm not sure. I've got two that are really light right now. So I, I've made up a couple of uh, sugar frames for them and I want to drop them in, but I need a, to find you know a couple of days where it's warm enough where I can get in there and do that for them. So, How many top bars versus Langstroth are you running? I got four top bars at the moment and I've got uh, 10, nine, nine Langs at the moment. So okay. I'm actually going to reduce my number of Langs this year and go more towards top bars. What, Bob? Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. You're my holdout, man. So have you have you ever worked a top bar? No, See, but I've just I've lived vicariously through your your insanity for years. Well, I'm I'm gonna keep, <laughs> keep some warnings, but I'm not not giving up on it. But I was just I was like I I, I want to give a course. I think we should have a talk sometime on why you should keep a top bar. <laughs> right. I mean, because I mean, if you want the most zen experience keeping bees, although Joan doesn't 
didn't have that experience when she tried it. So I'm going to have to work with Joan this year, help her have that. But it, it's just, it's just, I was wrong. yeah, it's just beautiful. I mean, working at Top R, it's just, it's just like Zen, you know, it's just nice. And, you know, it's like you open it up, you pull a bar back and everyone's like, hey, dude, man, what's happening? You know, yes, it's, it's, it's just, it's just nice. And it's you're not like, lifting boxes or any of that crap. And stuff, you know, it's, it's, I do like it a lot. Well, that, that's going to be your next talk, Bob. Yeah. Get, get ready for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have no screen bottom board in the top bar. None. No yeah. Board. See, I, I couldn't not have a screen bottom board. We put that and it couldn't do it. We tried, but it didn't work. Yeah, I, 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 I did try it with screen bottom boards, and, and it, it was a disaster. <laughs> and it didn't work for me at all. So, yeah, that... No, so I, I've, I've even tried it with just like a couple of just a little screens for ventilation on the bottom and that one didn't work well either. You know, so I, I don't know. I, you know, I know that I've seen people do it and they have the, what do you, what do you call it? Dictomaceous di earth, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, they put that below the screen. Um, I mean, maybe that works. I don't know, it just, you know, but it you know, didn't work for me. So, uh, so I'm going to try Slovenian hives this year. Any words of wisdom? Slovenian hives, any words of wisdom? I think Slovenian hives are really cool. They are really fun to work with. So for anyone who's, you know, anyone who's with us today that doesn't know what a Slovenian hive is, a Slovenian hive is, uh, is a fixed amount of space, right? And generally it is essentially the equivalent of like two deeps or maybe three deeps if you get a really big one. Um, and, you, and you open it from the back. And then you pull the frames out like you would pull out books from a bookshelf. Um, if you were in Slovenia, um, you know, Switzerland or someplace like that, what you have is the, the bottom section, uh, you have the bottom piece, which is the brood box, and then there is a queen excluder generally. And then you have up here, which is the, the honey stores. You'd obviously pull out the queen excluder in the winter time. So, you know, she can get up uh, up there. Um, the, the challenge with a Slovenian hive is that it is a fixed amount of space. And so you can't add a honey super to it once it fills up or anything like that. So you do have to harvest honey a little bit more frequently, um, you know, once it's fully built out uh, to that. Um, other than that, it's pretty much like uh, running a Langstro. Um, it's, it's, it's a really fun hive to work with. They're engineered uh, just beautifully. It's, it's like a piece of cabinetry. Um, you know, in fact, I've got two. Um, I think if you uh, if you've got um, a Slovenian hive, if you bought it from Jana uh, down here in um, Alexandria, she's making them actually to the Langstro um, uh, dimensions, so they can use the Langstro um, uh, foundation. If you have a true Slovenian hive, uh, the frames are actually a slightly different uh, dimension. If anyone's interested in having one of those, I actually have two of them. Um, that I'm not going to be using, so I, you know, be willing to, you know, part with those if someone wants a Slovenian. I'm committed to horizontal. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying the, the Slovenian hives. I mean, I, I don't know if you have a hive house or not, but, um, you know, that's a very, very interesting uh, concept, and and it's it, but it is very constricting, right? Like you said, it's very constricting. You have mm -hmm. a you have defined amount of space, but mm -hmm. have you found that to be more dependable than your your traditional Langstroth? I mean, I, I find a, I think if, well, if I had a hive house, right? So, so yeah, so the other thing is normally what you would do is you would take a whole bunch of these. You might take mm -hmm. two and stack this one on this one, and then you might do them four wide. And then you actually, they, they actually form the front of like a shed and then you work them from the back and you have a whole room behind you with your extraction equipment and everything there, right? So it's all one giant self-contained beekeeping operation. Um, I. I have a little sort of a little shed shed container that I made for, for two of them. So I can have two and then there's doors back there and stuff. Um, I, what I, what I should have done is make my little shed a little bit wider than the hives themselves. Cause it was kind of constrained getting in there, pulling stuff in. It was, it was very narrow the way I built it. I would have built it a slightly different way if I was to do it again. Um, <clears throat> but it's, you know, but I think it's, the, it's just the fact that it's a fixed amount of space, just like a top bar. It's a mm -hmm. fixed amount of space you've got to, you know, think about your management a little bit differently because you just can't throw another box on top of it. Right. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's, let's, who's doing the horizontal hives? Uh, I'm committed to horizontal hives. Good to have support 
for other than Langstroth hive. So you can do horizontal hives and using Langstroth frames as well, right? So that may be what you're talking about, JP. Um, yeah, and you know, going horizontally is nice and easy, and you don't have to lift anything. Um, it's also great for you know, uh, you know, um, people who who really can't lift things and stuff. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going horizontal. I've I've got uh, two horizontal hives as well. I was running uh, both of them last year, um, and then I converted them to um, vertical for the winter time. Just it was easier on me. Uh, I'm willing to try a Slovenian hive. Do yours accommodate Langstroth frames? Mine don't. The ones that I have don't use the Langstroth frames. Mine are actually the, the uh, AZ dimensions. So the, the, according to the dimensions of the original uh, designer. The other kind of interesting thing about the, the Slovenia is it actually has a double wall front. There's a, there's a front to it, there's an air gap, and then there's another wall, right? So it's super insulated on the front and then you're putting it inside a building, right? So it's actually made to go in you know, really, really cold weather. You know? And Virginia is not really, really cold like that. Um, you know, so you know, again, it's just, just a different way of managing. <clears throat> what else? What other hives can we try? Let's see. I've seen a few members try Ware hives. Um, and Ware is sort of, uh, they're, they're only, they're, they're small boxes like this and you go vertical with them. And then they have bars like a top bar as opposed to frames. And then, you know, traditionally with a Ware, what you want to do is rather than super them on top, the theory is you actually lift it up and put supers new boxes under, underneath and the bees keep going down and then you've just harvest the ones off the top as you go about it. I think that mm -hmm. probably worked about hundred years ago when you were in a field of flowers and the bees were going crazy all the time, but um, I've never seen anyone in this area successfully manage one that way. I don't know, any other fun? Now we're, now we're into different types of hives that we're talking about. Yeah, any, any questions on anything, any, anybody? <laughs> Bob's ready. <laughs> hmm. All right. I guess we're uh, it's a wrap. We're we're at the end. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bob.